listening to Resist and Restore, a podcast from the Circle of Hope Pastures, where we're extending the table of our dialogue. I'm Johnny Rashid. I use he, him pronouns. And I'm Rachel Sensenig. I use she, her pronouns. I'm Julie Hoke. I use she, her pronouns, too. We're coming to you right on the heels of something terrible that's happened in Philadelphia and something that happens so frequently, both in this city, in this region, and in our country. There was a shooting outside of a school yesterday after a football scrimmage that left a 14-year-old dead. Um, when we experience these things, there aren't words, thoughts that are very coherent. You know, you just feel the pain, the tragedy, the senselessness. Um, and if you're me, you feel the helplessness. Um, yeah. We want to extend the table to talk a little bit about this as we get our show started. Mm. Thanks, Johnny. One of the, I'm feeling the sadness too. My cell was weeping last night um, over a friend who was shot and killed last week as well. Um, he had just graduated from college, um, and it was it was really random and and senseless. So yeah, we're we're here feeling it. And I know, Julie, you live up by Roxboro, where the shooting happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, I only learned about it last night, actually. I saw some someone post something that um, alerted me. And, you know, I... I was in the midst. I, I had my cell meeting last night, so um, I was out across Germantown. Um, and before that, my kid was at his sports practice, and we were doing the after school run around and pick up. And um, so, yeah, it wasn't until right before <clears throat> I went to bed that I was reading about this, and I, I just found myself. Um, uh, just kind of reeling to to absorb the reality yet again of another shooting and just thinking about these kids coming off of a football scrimmage, you know, walking off the field, heading home. Uh, mm. There were three high schools involved um, there playing, uh, playing one another. I haven't heard anything about uh, any details of of um, suspects or or motive, but it doesn't even matter. Like I just can't wrap my mind around mm -hmm. uh, what drives this kind of violence and the just the devastating impact of um, the loss of life. It's final. It's done. It's over. Mm -hmm. This this kid, this fourteen year old, you know, my fourteen year old was just getting picked up and coming home too. Mm. Yeah. I woke up wanting to text Rand. I still am gonna do that. He's he's the leader of our peacemaker team and he's getting us started on a new initiative this year that is a long a very long term project. Um but it's organizing to stop the flow of guns from illegally reaching the streets of of our region, and um, I'm just I'm just so thankful for this for this new effort among us. I know it's one small ray of hope in this in this picture of ongoing grief and loss, but I'm. I'm thanking God for it right now with you all because um, it it does it does feel so so big, and it's really easy to feel helpless and hopeless um, about the prospect that you could just walk down the street and and be in a gunfight. Um, but if we can if we can kind of get to the 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 source of the market and where like and how people are profiting off of this violence it's um it's something we can do julie i know you're on the team too could you tell us more about it 
Yeah, I think uh, that that helplessness you talk about is is like the most human response in the face of um, devastating gun violence um, Mm -hmm. that just continues. You know, there's just Mm -hmm. there's always another story. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But the folks who gathered with Rand um, to talk about this, we're we're looking at we're asking the question, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Because that sense of helplessness could leave us all just to um, sort of turn off or uh, Mm -hmm. look the other way or just keep moving as if there is nothing we can do. And Mm -hmm. and we're asking this question of like, what what else is behind? Like I said earlier, I can't wrap my mind around what's behind this violence. Actually, we can. There is research and data out there that show... um, just how big the industry of uh, the the gun industry is mm-hmm. and that it is this violence is a result of supply and demand and um, that the the flow of weapons can be tracked and mm-hmm. interrupted and so rather than focusing so much of the n- news really highlights you know community gun vi- violence and the shooter or the victims uh, and the criminal justice system, et cetera. This is um, uh, a space where where Rand is leading us to make some space for asking these questions of like, but beyond that, before that, is there a way to interrupt gun violence by interrupting the flow of weapons so that access is limited? Because this kind of violence doesn't happen everywhere around the world, you Mm -hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. so that that's that's where we're at. It's just the beginning, like you said. Um, we're 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 looking for people who know more about this than we do, who are already involved, um, who uh, we could partner with, um, or who would want to partner with us. But mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. and we're encouraged by a small victory, uh, actually not so small, uh, a victory that we were part of a few years ago um, when one of the gun shops, when we protested at one of the gun shops in Philadelphia, Colosimos, that was illegally distributing guns, and that shop was shut down when the owner would not agree um, to abide by the law. And so... Um, we've identified the gun shops in, in Philadelphia that are still doing this illegal practice and yeah, we want (laughs) to go after it. And I simply ask people to, to follow the law, um, which I think is not saying much, but it could, it could prevent the flow of mass amounts of of guns uh, on the streets if we can if we can interrupt um and i i just want to call attention to the movement of prayer too involved here um because one of our friends wrote to us this week and and thanked us for um telling a story on the last podcast about about how we're leaning into prayer. Um, our friend Sony, in particular, is a, a leader in our con- congregation, and she. I told the story about how she prayed for me, and it was really meaningful and encouraging to me. And she's been doing that in our Sunday meetings for others who want prayer. And so I, I guess I'm mentioning here because let's not underestimate. Um, the power of God, the power of Jesus to come alongside us in this effort to to stop violence in our city, in our region. Yeah, we need a spiritual solution to these problems are important because if a 14-year-old getting killed doesn't change your politics, then you need some sort of um, divine intervention. Mm. Because we don't, lacking the political will to do something about this, which Congress does, which the Pennsylvania legislator does, um, is unconscionable. 
that that we are aggressively and assertively solving these problems you know mm -hmm. some people talk about like more law enforcement in terms of like catching bad guys but police are violent too we only have violent answers right so need a transformation for how we function mm -hmm. you know access to guns is a huge part of that you know um but what we do with the guns how we respond why this happens so much there's a lot of factors there right and then also like i know a lot of people that l w want to leave philadelphia because of this mm -hmm. um and so it's not good for the city in that sense but it um makes us more cloistered it makes us more afraid more suspicious more prejudicial and that leads to more and more problems mm -hmm. um so we need local effort but you know national effort and um in order to have the nerve to actually do this we need courage from god um so my prayer is about being able to face the discomfort of being of overtly naming political solutions um because we, we, there's hesitation to do that when there's a shooting that happens people will say don't politicize it you know which means like don't talk about gun laws don't make this about your politics and that's painful because we're trying to solve the problem mm -hmm. you know um so i might I'm, i think that god does need to intervene and make a change in how we how we function how we live um and it's good that our local efforts are touching systemic issues you know because like the kid that got shot yesterday you could i mean we, we we need to obviously protect our kids immediately but it's just not um it's such a bigger issue it happens all the time mm -hmm. you know 23 children in philadelphia this year had been killed by guns <sighs> You know, so that's horrifying. And hundreds more wounded. Children. You know, like if your society, if your society can't protect kids from getting killed, it, it's a failed society. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So we really do need, uh, you know, God to intervene and to mm -hmm. change how we think about the world and change our own hesitation around what is plainly what could be plain solutions, you know? Lord, hear our prayer. Yes. Do you think God looks at... After the... So May 24th was the Uvalde shooting that occurred. And the day after that, I quoted uh, something from Amos. Amos is this violent and angry book in the Bible where God is wrathful and enraged at the injustice that's happening and to god the, the the worship of god in the face of injustice without confronting the injustice is hypocrisy and god doesn't appreciate it in amos you know he'll say like i hate your festivals i hate your citadels you know i mm -hmm. wonder what god does in in, in even like hearing Christian praise of God in the face of this injustice. Like, you're not even doing this. Mm. You're not mm -hmm. even doing the basic things. You know, it's like when Jesus gets mad in Luke 11 about, yeah, great, it's good that you've tithed your gold and your, your, uh, your mint and your dill and your cumin, but you've ignored these parts of the law. Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah, you can worship me, you can take communion, you can baptize people, but you're still letting a 14-year-old get killed in the street. So, what gives? I don't care for your worship. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 who are you worshiping? What's happening? Like, why, if you love me, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, I wonder if God looks at the United States like that sometimes. Mm. Because so many of us are Christians. So many of us are supposed to be following Jesus, following God. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well Thank said. You. Yes. I think God is no stranger to the individualism, the greed, the white supremacy that shapes our country and shapes us. And yeah, we need a communal transformation. Totally. Totally.
Thanks again for listening to our podcast. We want to keep connecting with you. Email Resist and Restore Podcast at circleofhope.net just to tell us you're listening. Maybe you can make a comment about, you know, what I talk with Bethany Bender about and long COVID today, or maybe Rahadi's conversation with me last week on his book, When We Belong. There's a lot of opportunity for you to engage. Um, you can also go to circleofhope.church to see more about our cells, more about our Sunday meeting. You can still log in on Zoom and online to a lot of our cells. We still have some permanently online cells too. So if, you, if you're not in the Delaware Valley, you can find another way to connect. Um, and then share this podcast, give it a high rating, um, and then subscribe to it too. If you subscribe, you'll get it right away. And if you give it a high rating, people will see it. And then if you share it directly with someone, obviously they'll listen to it. We're looking for people who are looking for what we're doing. And you can help us find them. Hey friends, I'm so pumped to have my friend Bethany Bender on our show. Bethany is part of our community in Circle of Hope and has been for some time, and I'm excited to have her here. Welcome, Bethany. Hey, Johnny. Thanks for having me. Bethany has been on our show before, actually, and you might be the first repeat guest. I don't know. Oh, wow. um, honor. We had you on a few years ago, at the right at the beginning of the pandemic, because you contracted COVID nineteen early on in the pandemic. Is that right? Yes. So, what month did you get COVID? In March. Um, so March of twenty twenty. Yeah i I think that I was exposed on March 9th. Um, I didn't start feeling any symptoms until the sixteenth, though. So, it could have happened anywhere in between. Wow. It's starting to work from home. <laughs> so before this, um, I don't know if you would say you were perfectly healthy, but you're, you were living a full life, right? Um, and then on March 16th, you have COVID. Tell us about the, 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 the beginning of that experience for you. Yeah. Um, I think I remember saying on the show a couple of years ago that I was re- I was experiencing a lot of anxiety, and then when I got sick, I I stopped being so anxious. I guess because the worst thing had happened, mm. um, and I guess when I look back now, um, it feels a little bit like blissful ignorance. Um, and it feels like a really long time ago. So you were anxious about it. You got it. Well, the worst thing has happened. And now you're looking back at this relative freedom you had because you contracted COVID as blissfully ignorant. Yeah. Or, you know, I guess positive in a way that I hadn't been before might be a, a nicer way to put it. Um, I felt really positive. I felt that, you know, I had recovered. Um, I had gotten through this and I was going to be able to um, help other people out because mutual aid is something that needed to happen and began happening like a lot during the pandemic. Um, So I think I was right on that front. Um, But my ability to assist others uh, was greatly impeded by having COVID and then having long COVID. So what happened after you, you got the virus, you got the, you got infected and did you just experience like kind of regular COVID symptoms at first? No. Um, I, well, so at first, um, the first thing I felt was fatigue when I was acutely ill, um, like a very deep fatigue. Um, I did develop some of the classic COVID symptoms like loss of taste and smell, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. a horrible cough, aches, um, and then the fatigue and, you know, headaches, things like that, um, some of the common neurological symptoms. Um, And the majority of those greatly lessened or went completely away after about two weeks. after that point, I did continue to be fatigued. Um, I did notice that. And then once I started getting outside a little bit more, 
um, when it started getting nicer out, I noticed that I would get short of breath really easily. Um, like just walking a block or two or walking up one flight of stairs right. out of breath. Um, and prior to the acute infection, I was, you know, very active running and biking and doing all kinds of things. Um, and I wasn't really able to do any of that afterwards. Um, and I kind of just chalked it up to, you know, I got sick. It's taking some time to recover. And that was a week's after. That was weeks after. That so, was like May through August of 2020. And you just thought, I got sick. I'm still getting, I'm still recovering from it. When did you, when did you know you had long COVID? Mm. Or how did you know? Yeah. So I started seeing things about long COVID probably in like May or June of 2020. And, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of information. There wasn't a lot of um, fear about it. It wasn't very well known. Um, I feel like until recently, a lot of people haven't even heard of like the long-term effects of COVID. Um, but I was experiencing these things and experiencing a lot of fatigue. And so I was symptom Googling and trying to figure out what was going on. Um, mm. I, the first time I scheduled a doctor's appointment for like ongoing issues was in September, 2020. So I would say that was when I was like, yes, there's definitely something wrong. I need to go to the doctor. And what, and what the doctor say? Um, the doctor said that I had high cholesterol and that nothing else was wrong with me. Um, and that, did that ring true to you? No, I mean, the cholesterol thing, sure, whatever. Um, I had been sitting around for six months. So I was like, okay, you know, I haven't been very active. That makes sense. But it really doesn't make any sense to me that I'm still this fatigued and the shortness of breath is really weird. Um, that's a real concern to me. So I was actually, I was really upset, um, with my doctor and, uh, have never seen that doctor since. <laughs> so you stopped seeing the doctor. Have you found a doctor that takes you seriously? Yes. I found one quickly after that, um, in the same practice. Um, so my general practitioner took me seriously the first time I spoke to her. Um, and that meant a lot to me. Um, that she took my complaint seriously um, and actually wanted to run some tests and try to figure out what was wrong. That meant a lot. Awesome. And, and did you conclude anything? No. <laughs> uh, well, sort of. But I spent several months going to specialists with zero answers. Mm. Um, you know, did a few tests with my PCP and then moved on to specialists. But um, nothing was really showing up. Um, I didn't have like visible damage in my lungs on an x-ray. Um, I did the breathing tests well at the pulmonologist. Um, you know, they said, oh, your cardio is great. Like you should be totally fine. Right. Um, and whenever they would say, you know, your tests are normal. Great. Um, the happiness was like astonishing because I was like, I'm not happy. Yes, I don't have COPD. That's good. That's very good. But I don't know what's wrong with me. And that's very scary. It is. You're feeling yeah. all these things. The tests aren't coming up conclusive. You've had this experience where you're already tired. Your doctor mm -hmm. isn't listening to you at first. Mm -hmm. So people with who have long COVID mm -hmm. are have limited energy as it is. And then with the energy that they have to find out more, mm -hmm. they're not taken seriously. And so yeah. th that's a, that's a bad cycle. Oh, definitely. There's definitely um, people I think are being taken more seriously these days. Um, although that's not going to be every doctor. That's um, true. Definitely more known about just the long-term effects of contracting the virus are wide and varied, but there is a pretty particular kind of like subset of long COVID that 
that is prevalent. So what is long COVID? What do we know about it? Yeah. Um, long COVID is getting the virus and not getting better or Mm -hmm. briefly getting better and then getting much worse, um, or new symptoms, new organ damage, um, loss of brain matter. Uh, there are so many things that happen. People uh, say like they have a brain fog. Is that what, cause your brain is literally, you're losing brain matter. That may be one of the causes of brain fog. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of like non-specific symptoms that could be attributed to various things. Um, but I would say that like brain fog, um, fatigue, joint pain, nerve pain, headaches, um, other neurological mm. symptoms, muscle weakness. Those are some of the pretty common ones. So then how did it, what are the lifestyle changes that you've made because of you having long COVID? How has your life changed? My life has changed drastically. Um, you know, at first it was just, I wasn't exercising. Um, mm-hmm. The shortness of breath and the heart palpitations. Um, but because that never resolved and I, I continued to try to do everything in my life the way that I was used to doing it. Um, you know, I was doing yoga and working from home full time and, um, you know, still trying to socialize over zoom. Um, and I wasn't able to keep that up. Um, things started getting worse. It definitely caught up with me that I was not resting and just doing nothing. So last summer in 2021, um, the, my symptoms got a lot worse and, um, I was experiencing a lot of joint pain. And then I ended up essentially being bed bound for most of the summer. Um, Mm. And I was still working. Um, I was still working full time at the beginning of the summer. um, I dropped some hours as the summer went on and I tried to work with my boss to um, accommodate myself so that I could be able to work well. but that really wasn't working. And so in August of last year, I stopped working um, and eventually lost my job um, because I could not work anymore. Um, and so that's been a huge change. I've been working since I was 14 years old, like since I could get a work permit, you know, that's a big part of my identity is what I do. Yeah. And it's a it's a huge part of anyone's identity. I think. So that was a huge life change. And in the past year, um, my life has looked radically different. My day to day is much slower. I live on a much slower pace than a lot of people do. Um, I, yeah, I, I just live at a, at a slower pace. When you, Lost your job and you stopped working and then eventually lost your job. Um, were you able to access any government benefits? At the time, no. Um, I couldn't get unemployment because it was considered a willful termination to um, extend my leave beyond the approved FMLA period. A what termination? Um, willful. Willful termination. termination. Yeah. So, which is just insulting, quite honestly, but, uh, it is insulting. Couldn't access unemployment. Um, I talked to people about applying for social security disability. And a lot of them said, you know what, wait until you've been out of work for six months to a year and then apply. And then it'll still take a long time to get approved if you ever get approved. So I was like, okay, that doesn't seem like a viable option yet. Um, I did get the stimulus checks, which were very helpful. Could use one of those again, any day now. Um, totally. but yeah, I, the government really, really dropped the ball on this one for me. Um, but my community picked up the ball, fortunately and my loved ones. Um, that's good. And, 
And we have to remember, not everyone has access to those private um, opportunities, Absolutely. family that can help, communities that can help. So you get COVID, you get long COVID, your doctor doesn't believe you, you have to stop working, the government doesn't believe you, they think it's a willful termination, you can't get access to benefits. Some legislation was passed that gave you some money for your livelihood. Right. That ran out. And then you have a support network that can support you, but a lot of people don't have that. So you're seeing, I hope that the audience is seeing, this is how oppression works. You know, like this is how people get, get, this is, you're just seeing someone who is, and, and you were previously in, you were working. You are mm -hmm. able-bodied, yeah. um, white. Very so, involved with politics on the ground. You had a social position. Mm -hmm. You contracted this infection. Your body changed. And then literally your social position changed in society. When you became disabled, you became worse off. And yeah. all the things, and, 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 and really what's helped sustain you there was previous access to resources. That not everyone has access to. Yeah, definitely. I would say it's absolutely a blessing to have been part of Circle of Hope, um, to have some of the really supportive family members and friends that I have. Um, and just generally, I think uh, I've learned a lot about asking for help, um, which is really hard for me to do. And I'm, I've been very self sufficient my whole life, very independent, or at least I felt that way. Um, so it was hard mm. to be no longer independent. And it's taken a big mindset change. So here you are, you're, you're, you're trying to move into the next thing. Let's talk about the reality of long COVID. Mm -hmm. The fact that, first of all, the virus is here. We do have a new booster that we're really not talking enough about not enough people are getting it, but it does help. At least we think it could help with long COVID. Mm. Um, but what does long COVID mean for us today in terms of pandemic best practices for a long time? I mean, the pandemic has been so interesting in the beginning. They said kids couldn't get COVID, right? Like they just said, they just say things. You don't need masks. Kids can't get COVID. There's always this like uh I'll be partisan when saying this. There's like a neoliberal uh, motive to try to like say it's not that bad. Society can still function as it is. Kids can go to school. You should go into work, et cetera. And I feel like right now, two and a half years into this thing, um, people are tired enough that like the market forces that kind of get us back to normal are stronger than our energy against them. But the virus is still around. People are still being hospitalized. People are still dying. People are still getting long COVID. Um, what are the best, what, what should we do in our society right now? What are the best practices? Um, we should wear high quality masks. Um, anytime you're in public, you should wear a high quality mask. Um, at this point in the U.S., it can feel weird to do that sometimes. Um, especially like you mean a KN95 mask or an N95 mask or something yeah. like that? N95 and N95 or like an elastomeric respirator, um, which you can buy online as well. But basically something that's going to be um, a high filtration for very small particles that has a good seal specifically. Yeah. Um, so you want to wear that in public, in, in especially in, in indoor places and crowded places. Definitely. Um, those are the most important. Now, some of the the like Omicron strains are so virulent that you can get them, you know, walking outside or from, um, you know, a much wider area than we would normally think of, like the standard six feet away from something. Um, because it is airborne, it does travel. So it's a good practice to wear a mask um, if you're going to be around the public, um, strangers, anyone like that. Uh, I think the other thing that is huge that we are have a lot most people have not taken advantage of I think is air filtration um, in buildings specifically um, large buildings that have you know a huge airflow system um, if they're not filtering the air that can just lead to spreading the disease so 
filtering the air when we're inside is super, super important. Um, I saw recently that there was a group, it might have been DSA, that was doing these um, like filter boxes for school rooms yeah. for the Philadelphia School District. I thought that was pretty cool. It was DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's cool. That's really good. But we need better filtration systems. And I think that's part of the, that's part of like our climate problem too. I think it's all intersected, but um, yeah, I really think those two things, masking and better air filtration are kind of the key to getting out of this. So when you visit your friends indoors in their house, do you mask? It depends. Um, I often do. Um, if it's like, you know, my next door neighbor that I see all the time, I might not wear my mask in their house. Okay. Um, so you're still doing like the bubble thing kind of. I kind of am. And that's a personal choice. Um, some people, especially some people who are disabled or who are older and might be more vulnerable, um, might wear theirs all the time. Um, totally. Yeah. So it, like, it is for people, but it's definitely for me too. Yeah. So we're protecting people from getting the disease. And we have to remember that the immunocompromised are at risk. Elderly are still at risk. Mm -hmm. But this disease makes disables people for their yeah. lives. So like it's not – they become at-risk people. So mm -hmm. it like perpetuates itself in a toxic way. Um, so it's we should still be masking. The, and, 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 and the CDC is still saying all over the United States you should mask in high areas of high transmission, which is basically the whole country right now. Country, yeah. So like I understand that masks are optional. But the CDC and the Philadelphia is urging masking still. This is the interesting thing about like human anthropology, right? Like, because it's optional, we don't do it anymore. You know, it's like, it's like a motorcycle helmet law. It's like, okay, you don't have to wear your helmet, but hey, it might be a good idea to do it, you know, right? or like wear your seatbelt or something like that. Right. Um, and then it can be sociologically awkward if you're the only one masking. Absolutely. You know, I put on my mask in areas where a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. I send my kids to school in masks um, to protect them and so that they protect others. Um, but the this is the feeling that happens in me. Mm -hmm. And this is, they made me feel this way. I wear a mask in a room where not a lot of people are masking. And they say, are you guilting me into wearing a mask? You know? <laughs> Like, so I'm the bad guy for not wearing, for wearing a mask, right. you know? And then there's pressure that we all feel. We all want to fit in. So yeah. like, let me take off the mask, you know? And then you do that. And then all of a sudden you're creating a more dangerous situation. Absolutely. I was wearing a mask the other day in an elevator and there was one other person in the elevator. They were not wearing a mask. And they said, you're still worried about COVID? Um, did, did you know this person? No, I didn't know this person. Oh, wow. <laughs> you, have no idea. you have no idea. So <laughs> yes, what'd you say? I said, you know what? I have a really weak immune system. Um, I spent some time in the hospital this year and I'm not trying to go back. what they say? They said nothing. And I think that, um, I don't know, maybe they thought I was trying to make them feel guilty, but I just made it about me. Um, That's good. And I hope that they saw like oh this like young seemingly healthy person has something that would make COVID really harmful for them so right. I want people to do that I'm happy to share that with them it does it is difficult like in a social setting to totally when other people are not it's really hard yes it is and so like in our community at, at, at our congregation mm -hmm. we urge masking Mm -hmm. but the culture in the space is everyone masks. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's a bigger sociological force that is saying the norm here is we mask. Right. It's hard to disrupt that in other settings, you know, and we have masks available for people when they come in. So they don't feel 
left out or they don't feel because not everyone does, you know, so you still want to, and, and you have to be vaccinated too. Um, so you're saying mask everywhere. And I think getting vaccinated is a given in what you're saying too. Yeah. I mean, for some people, you know, there may be reasons that you are not able to get the vaccine for whatever reason. Um, my point of view would be that you should. Um, but I'm, I'm less, uh, I'm less a vaccine pusher as opposed to a mitigation pusher. Um, okay. Because because COVID has become more and more immune evasive, um, it's harder for the vaccines to work, basically. But um, very pro vaccine. I've gotten them. And we want them to get updated, and we yeah. want them to. I mean, once a year because it's so because it it it, it so readily changes. Yeah, you're flu shot and your COVID booster, you can just get them on the same day. The the last one, the last booster for me, I had absolutely no symptoms from it, but my flu shot hurt like hell. So I don't know. I got them both at the same time and I didn't feel great. So I don't know what did what particularly. Yeah. Let's talk about long COVID is teaching the COVID in general is teaching us about a lot of things. Like for example, yesterday there was a three uh, alarm fire at a Junkyard in North Philly. Mm -hmm. Junkyards are uh, often in poor communities uh, mm -hmm. where people are already suffering. There's more disabled people that are affected more by um, lack of access to all sorts of things, but medical care, particularly healthcare in particular. Um, my kid has asthma or close to asthma. Mm -hmm. So I told her, hey, I mean, I'm just looking at the sky. It's a billowing, right? And I'm like, hey, if you feel, pay attention to your breathing because we'll g I'll give you the medicine if you need it. Um, and now I'm paying attention to things like air quality. Yeah. And I'm paying attention for the first time about air quality. You know, mm -hmm. like even like cooking indoors, I'm thinking about air quality. There's all sorts of things that are like, because we are now thinking, at least I am, holistically about healthcare and about air respiration, these things. Um, long COVID has also helped us understand or exposed more another condition called MECFS. Can you explain the relationship between MECFS and long COVID? Sure. Um, so MECFS is otherwise known as uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, MECFS is the preferred term uh, for people who have it. Um, it's thought to be a post viral illness. A lot of people who contract a virus like um, uh, the original SARS or uh, Epstein Barr, which is mono, you know, lots of people get mono, um, and a few other viruses are thought to be because. Um, this syndrome or this group of syndromes um, that kind of come on after post-viral illness. And it's not very well researched. There's only a handful of true specialists and- In the whole country? In, in the whole world. In the whole world. And uh, there's, it's the, the least funded disease in the NIH. Um, currently gets about $15 million a year in funding for research, which is very, very little. Um, so there's not a lot known about it, um, but it affects a large proportion of people. More people have MECFS than have been diagnosed with MS, for example. Mm. Um, so it's a really big deal and it's very disabling. A lot of people end up bed bound or house bound. Um, it's it's pretty life-changing in a very difficult way. Um, and people who had MECFS and other chronic illnesses, other disabilities prior to the pandemic were kind of shouting into the void, this is a mass disabling event. Um, and they've been proven very right. Um, and long COVID is similar to MECFS in a lot of the ways that it uh, presents in people, um, the fatigue is really prominent, uh, the brain fog, 
uh, any other neurological symptoms like sound and light sensitivity, um, neuropathic pain, um, just just some of the the larger really disabling components of the diseases are the exact same. Um, there, but again, there's not a lot of specialists. Doctors are definitely learning more about post-viral illnesses, I think across the board, um, but there's a lot to catch up on uh, mm-hmm. for that has just gone ignored in society. Totally. So we're learning more about these post-viral illnesses, long COVID isn't ME-CFS, but they have a relationship and they can maybe even ca- one can cause the other. Yeah, so some people with long COVID definitely have ME-CFS, um, and some do not, but they're trending towards uh, being the same thing in do a you, lot of ways. Do you think, do you say you have ME-CFS? I would say that I do, yes. Um, that's one thing I have not been formally diagnosed with. There have There are other things that I've been diagnosed with since having COVID. Um, that are syndromes that are usually related to ME-CFS. So, um, you know, some of the orthostatic problems or issues with my autonomic nervous system, basically the things that your body does automatically, my body doesn't want to do automatically. Mm-hmm. Or it wants to do and those things are really similar across the board with ME-CFS. And they're now looking at biomarkers in both ME-CFS and long COVID that are looking similar. Totally. That's yeah. so so we're seeing that. Yeah. A lot of times doctors that I see. Mm-hmm. So like there are some good doctors that are very interested in this work and they publish good material or they write good things on Twitter or whatever publication they're writing for. And I've seen that. Mm-hmm. But I've seen a lot of um doctors talk about long COVID and MECFS as like a psychological phenomenon and not a physiological one. So it's happening in your head and not in your body. Now, I for one think that such a distinction is unhelpful anyway. Yeah. Because our bodies and minds are very connected. Very dualistic. But what are the problems with saying this is just in your head? I mean, it's a huge issue because people are experiencing real pain, real fatigue, real disruption in their lives. And absolutely mental illnesses are physical illnesses too. Um, But there are some very distinct physical features of this illness that I would have such a hard time contributing to my thought pattern, you know? Um, Totally, totally. And, you know, one of the things that um, has happened is uh, people who have had COVID are at a really high risk of new. Uh, mental illnesses. Um, And my theory is just my theory, but becoming chronically ill is very depressing. And if you don't have something going on, uh, I don't know what's, what's actually wrong with you because it's depressing. It causes anxiety. It can cause so many new, new issues with your mental health, just being ill. So I think there's definitely some connection, but it might be more abstract. Um, You know, there are biomarkers now that we've found. Um, One of the... What's a biomarker? Yeah, a biomarker would be something that shows up in a test. So um, if all of your tests are coming back um, as not showing anything, they're coming back negative, um, then... For medical doctors in the United States, there's really nothing they can do for you. Um, The system with insurance companies and for-profit hospitals um, means that doctors are going to spend 15 minutes with you if you're lucky. Um, They're going to record their notes and they're going to bill it. And that's Mm -hmm. what they do. That's kind of how the system works. And unless you go outside of that system to other much more expensive treatments, um, you're not gonna find anything. So having a quick biomarker um, that a doctor can easily order a test for is really important. Um, In both being able to 
believe the patient, but then in being able to get them treatment. Makes Super. sense. Believing the patient, there's physiological symptoms. There can also be psychological ones, mental health ones. It's all connected. Um, and I, you know, from my perspective, like you're saying, it's important to believe what people are going through, you know, in our communities, when doctors don't, it undermines trust in medicine and for, and the pharmaceutical industries and so on. And so potential solutions could be frowned upon or could be avoided. You know, there are people who don't want to get vaccinated because they don't trust the medical community and they don't trust the medical community because of how they've been gaslit by them. And so like, this is a, this is really hard. Like these problems feed into themselves, you know, mm -hmm. Um, mistrust, especially among communities of color, especially among black and brown communities. Um, we see racism exacerbating distrust in the medical community. And these, and these are people because they're sometimes even disabled or immunocompromised that would benefit from vaccination, for example, but they don't want to do it because they don't trust the medical community, and for good reason. There's a difference between like uh, genuine mistrust in the medical community and mm -hmm. the folks who think that a computer chip is going into your arm yeah. because of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's absolutely legitimate reasons to be wary of the medical and scientific community in this country, 100%. It's, that's hard to get around. And for some people, it's not as much of a problem. They don't think about it. And that's a privilege. Totally. How can the church support people with ME, CFS, and long COVID? How would you feel best supported? Yeah. So um, policies that support us being alive are really important in our, in our groups, in our spaces. Um, so masking is really important if we're going to be together in any way um, as a group, you know, in public. Um, I think one of the other thing that's, things that's huge that is so difficult is um, virtual spaces. So sometimes just on some days, if I'm really fatigued, I ha might have one down and back up the stairs in me for the day. And that's it. And then I'm laying in bed doing nothing because I've used all of my mental and, mental and physical energy. So. Being able to access social events virtually is really important. Um, and during the pandemic, virtual everything has been huge. Um, but as things have gone back more and more to, quote, normal, unquote, there's been a lot less of that. Um, or yeah, not you know, everything has a Zoom link anymore. Exactly. Not everything has a Zoom link. And it can be difficult to just leave the house, much less risk getting, you know, another illness by going in and being with a lot of people. So those two things are really big. Um, virtual meetings and virtual activities increase accessibility just across the board. Um, and you can even add captions. There's so many cool things that you can do um, that are difficult to do in person. Um, so I'd say masking and virtual events. Those are like the two biggest things for involving people in our community who have MECFS or other disabilities and chronic illnesses. That's going to be huge. So masking when you're in person, especially indoors, mm -hmm. creates an environment where people can come. Mm -hmm. But because it's arduous sometimes to even show up somewhere, an online option is helpful. And I would add that non-hybrid events are often better. Now, we live stream. We have a Zoom link for our Sunday meetings each week, and we also mask inside. Events that are just virtual, though, mm -hmm. kind of put us all on the same page. They kind of flatten the hierarchy a little bit. And I think those are important, too. Yeah. And I, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, when uh, everything went virtual and everyone was participating virtually, um, that was a huge moment for a lot of disabled people who had felt very left out for a very long time. And all of a sudden, um, you know, things were taking place virtually that they were told would never take place virtually. They were told, you know, people might have lost their jobs because they were told they could never work from home. And now everyone's working from home full time. 
Um, so it's a little bit of a slap in the face, but it's also a little bit of a look into what we could have as a community if everyone were included. I think that's something to think about and take home for sure. Once able-bodied people needed virtual options, the impossible so-called became possible. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people are still working remotely too, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's still options like that. So those are some things we can do um, to support disabled people and specifically people with long COVID and MECFS. Um, anything else you want to say? Um, yeah, one thing would be that this is this is a recommendation that I make frequently. Um, but if you want to learn more about MECFS and kind of get a picture into what long COVID is like for a lot of people, um, you should definitely check out the film Unrest. It's on Netflix. Um, the creator and director has MECFS herself. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's a big activist in the community now, in the disabled community and MECFS and chronic illnesses. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, and it's on Netflix. It's on Netflix, yes. And I've showed it to people and usually they say, wow. I Yeah, I've seen I- it myself. Yeah. yeah. It's really powerful. Um, it's disturbing and also inspiring. So I highly recommend watching. Well, thank you so much, Bethany, for being on our show. We loved having you, and we love you being a part of our community, too. Thanks, Johnny. I really enjoyed being on. Good to talk to you. Thank you, Johnny and Bethany. This last section is a time when we like to share how God has been nourishing our souls as pastors and community members and community leaders. Um, and so I'm wondering, pastors, how, how has God been meeting you? What's been nourishing your souls recently? This is Spiritual Show and Tell. I was given a book. I've mentioned this on the podcast before because it was coming out. Um, But I was given a copy of the book on repentance and repair, making amends in an unapologetic world by Danya Ruttenberg. She is a rabbi um, who is a brilliant writer. And this book is nourishing my soul. It is like the, the most... Um, what do I want to say? Practical, uh, almost guide to, um, repentance. I haven't gotten even to the repair part. (laughs) I'm still, I'm still getting into the book, but I'm a couple chapters in and, um, I wanted to share a little, a little piece of this. What the, the reason it's so nourishing to my soul is that it is just so, um, beautifully uh, captures the the opportunity for transformation that Jesus offers us when we follow in the way of Jesus um, and confess and repent um, and seek forgiveness. You know, these are all, it's all interwoven in um in our theology, in the teachings of Jesus. Um, But she, she delves into, I guess, like the nuances of what it means to actually like make a meaningful confession. And then the Mm -hmm. multiple steps that it takes to repent. Like, it's not just like an, I'm sorry, you know, (laughs) Um, anyway, Uh, One of these steps that she talks about is making different choices. It's almost like uh, this is too reductionistic, but it's almost like there there's like there there are steps to apply here that have tangible um, um, outpourings or results or something. (laughs) And and if we can practice this kind of meaningful repentance as Christians in the world, um, I just think the gospel will be on display in a Mm. way that is uh, just undeniable because of the life-giving power of 
transformation that Jesus mm. offers. Anyway, she talks about transformation. She said, it's the work of facing down the false stories and engaging with painful realities. It's the work of being open to seeing ourselves as we really are, of understanding that our other people's needs and pain are at least important, if not more so than our own. It's about mm. figuring out how to be the kind of person who sees others suffering and takes responsibility for any role we might have in causing it. Mm. It's about ownership, owning who we have been and what we have done, and also owning the person that we are capable of becoming. Mm. And I think that is so beautiful because it's not just about um, um, for the sake of someone else. You know, right. repentance is for our sake. It's it's for our own transformation and freedom and becoming more fully who we can be. So that's, that's just one little snippet, but there's so much. It is really a beautiful book um, and it's nourishing to me. Thank you, Julie. I can't wait to read that. I have a copy for you, actually, both of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> From Corinne. <laughs> What's it called again? On Repentance and Repair by Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg. Circle of Hope's daily prayer is nourishing my soul. This week's prayers, they're written by my friend Andrew Yang, and he is, first of all, they used to be anonymous, and now, like, you don't have to write them anonymously if you don't want to. So Andrew is telling us about his process writing these songs, which is kind of nice, right? Because, like, that, you can't have that experience anonymously. And I'm just reminded of the seasons that he wrote these songs in and what they meant and what they mean to him. And like even getting like his liner notes to be like, I wrote this for this reason. I wrote dead ways of living to mean sin when I took this passage in Romans and made it into a song. Um, and so his creativity and his insight um, is really nice. And it helps me experience the worship again and the songs in a new way, and I'm grateful for his gifts and how he shares them with us, and it's nourishing my soul. So go to circleofhope.net slash daily prayer deeper, and you can see them. I'm not sure when this podcast will come out, but they, they're, they're, they were out um, the week of September 26th to October 2nd is mm -hmm. the time frame that they're on, so you'll want to go back and look at those. Um, and then the tag for them is just like Andrew Yang's songs. So mm -hmm. you can click that and then see them. And then they're all on their music table too. Mm -hmm. So you can hear them if you want. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of them are on our records, the uh, audio art records that we have, which you can find on our band camp. And also wherever you stream music, you can find some of his songs too. So really cool stuff. Very grateful for Andrew. And that's been nourishing my soul. I've been singing God from God, light from light since yesterday. Mm. Yep. Me too. Me too. Thank you, Johnny. Andrew is a gift. Um, a book has been nourishing my soul as well. And really, more than a book, I feel like um, this author, Reverend Dr. Barbara Holmes, and the Holy Spirit are like pastoring me as I work through this book slowly, but it's called Crisis Contemplation, Healing the Wounded Village. And uh, Barbara Holmes wrote it during the pandemic um, as a response to, um, you know, how, how we're, we're in the middle of this crisis that is calling us to deeper healing and um i'll i'll just read the the description here um focusing through the lens of bipoc peoples the reverend dr holmes explores explores communal contemplative experiences and the resulting traumatic wounds which manifest across generations a deep look at healing through memory and story culture and ritual leads to envisioning of different futures through liminality and bio spiritual resurrection, so she, I, I just appreciate her depth um, so much. Her faith in God and the person of Jesus, and um, how she's calling us all to healing. Um, 
of wounds and it's it's helping me to it's a very communal um healing that she's calling us to but it involves this personal work so she's she's got these questions at the end of the chapters mm -hmm. that that are are asking me to go go like into my own history and experience um to do the work and i'm just i'm just really grateful for her and her work gives me hope well thank you for listening thank you for being here with us and if you have comments questions um stories from your own experience we would really love to hear them we are so encouraged by mm -hmm. any kind of talk back so please write to us at resist and restore podcast at circleofhope.net thank you johnny and join us next time god bless you <laughs>